Here we are in our last set of slides, Introduction to Credit Risk Models. Not so that we will be able to say much about credit risk models, but at least I want to present two basic approaches. Credit risk derivatives, uh, contracts which are based on the possibility of default, uh, are uh, a very big industry and they also had a, a big uh, kind of a negative role uh, in uh, in the big crisis of 2007-2008, uh, things like credit default swaps and other credit risk derivatives. All right, so let's see what kind of models people have invented for dealing with the possibility, the probability of a default risk being uh, not equal to zero. The first uh, set of models is called structural models. This is not as much used in industry as the next set of models that I will show you, uh, but uh, it has more intuition and it's more in the spirit of what we have been doing in this course and it's historically also was the first model. In fact, Merton uh, introduced the basic, uh, the simplest model of this type uh, early on and uh, this is all I'm going to present. In the meantime, uh, people have uh, made this model more realistic uh, and more sophisticated, but I will just show you the, the basic uh, model that Merton suggested. So Merton said, let's model the value of the firm, and the value of the firm uh, is uh, modeled as we model uh, stock prices in the black scholes merton model, uh, directly under the pricing probability. R, so dv is rv, there is a rv dt term and then sigma v dw term. Except I, uh, you may also want to uh, subtract here delta. Delta might be like dividend payments or some kind of payments that are going out of the value of the firm. All right? And then this firm issues debt which is like bonds, and also issues equity. And the value of the firm, in principle, is equal to the sum of the debt amount and the equity amount. So equity is just the value of the, of the stocks for this, uh, for this uh, firm. Uh, so instead of S, I'm, I'm going to be using E for equity. So the value of the firm, at least as long as there is no default, would be E plus uh, equity plus uh, debt. So at time t, v of t would, would be a of t plus d of t. And we are going to make a very simplifying assumption that that is uh, just one single bond, uh, zero coupon with maturity capital T and uh, final nominal value, face value capital D. Okay, so capital D is actually in this notation here, capital D of capital T. Uh, and uh, fine, if we make this simplifying assumption, uh, then we only have to worry about uh, possible default at time uh, t, and otherwise there is no uh, default. And uh, let's see what happens if there is default or if there, if there is no default. Well, in practice, if there is bankruptcy of a, of a firm, then First, the bondholders have the priority. They have what is left from the value of the firm. And uh, shareholders only receive the remaining uh, money, the remaining funds, if there are any. Okay? Or they may receive zero. If the firm goes bankrupt, they just lose uh, uh, all the stocks go to zero. The, the shareholders lose everything. Okay, so in a, you know, in a simplified world, there is, uh, bankruptcies are much more complicated, but this we are doing the simplest uh, model here. In such a model, then, at capital T, there might be bankruptcy, or maybe not. I, uh, when is going to be bankruptcy? The bankruptcy will happen if the um, value of the company is less than uh, the debt they have to pay to the bondholders the bond matured, they have to pay D. If they have less than D, if the total firm is less than D, uh, then this is negative uh, and there is nothing left for shareholders, the shareholders will get zero. Okay? 
On the other hand, if, um, so this is the value for the shareholders, the value of the equity at maturity of the debt. On the other hand, if V of capital T is larger than D, then the firm pays the debt to the debt holders, to the bondholders, and then the rest, uh, the rest uh, uh, is simply uh, equity from, from, this, uh, from this equation that the value of the firm is equity plus debt. Okay. In this regard here, now equity, the stock of the firm, is actually an option on the value of the firm, call option. You, you can recognize this as a call option on the value of the firm. Okay? So, so far we have always looked at the stock price as being modeled as a basic asset, so like something like this, and then we had call options, put options on the asset. But here, the uh, Merton is saying, well, in this kind of stylized bankruptcy procedure, uh, equity, the stock itself, is an option on the value of the firm. Okay? Now, we don't really want to price the stock. What we want to price uh, here is a defaultable bond, the bond of a company which can go bankrupt. So what, are, what is the final value uh, for the bondholders? The bondholders will receive a D if there is no bankruptcy, or they will receive everything uh, which is less than D when there is bankruptcy. They just get everything which, what is left, which is V of T, or, or altogether we can write that as a minimum between V of T and D. Okay? Either they get the full amount if the value of the firm is larger than D, they just get what it was promised, uh, the debt uh, face value D, or they, uh, if there is not enough money, they just get whatever is left in the firm. Fine, and you can actually write this as uh, D minus maximum of D minus V of T and zero. Uh, this is just a simple uh, algebra to check that uh, these two things are the same. I'm going to leave that to you. Why do we write it like this? Because now we can recognize that pricing the bond payoff, pricing the bond in this model, is the same as pricing a constant, that's easy, just present value, minus the price of a put option on the value of the firm with the strike price D. Right. So that was Merton's idea. Uh, we can, in fact, model corporate bond uh, in terms of a put option on the value of the firm because we can model the stock, the equity of the firm, as a call option on the value of the firm. Now, you can, you can make this more realistic, and people have done it by assuming that maybe uh, it's... Uh, the, the, the company can uh, go default at a random time, any time between zero and maturity. Uh, if the value hits uh, zero or some low level, it cannot really hit zero in this model, it's always positive. But if it, if it hits a uh, low enough uh, level, then it, it goes bankrupt. Uh, so you can generalize this in different ways. But this is the main idea. In fact, it, was, uh, it, it has been used in industry too. The, uh, th there was a company, KMV, where uh, Vasicek is V in that title, which was later sold to one of the investment banks, uh, wi which actually used this main idea uh, for their business of, of uh, providing valuation of corporate bonds and corporate debt. Uh, okay. So it's a, it's a kind of a nice, uh, uh, economically nice and uh, in intuit intuitive idea for pricing corporate uh, corporate meaning defaultable bonds. There is there, there are problems other than just this being kind of a too simplistic way of, of a view of bankruptcy. There is also a problem that we you don't actually observe V. The value of the firm is not directly observable, and it's not quite easy to decide exactly what the value of the firm is. Right. So so let's talk a little bit about that problem. And by the way, uh, before I go on, uh, this logic in the second half of the of the slide has nothing to do with the, with the model. This uh, you can always 
you can always make these arguments and then you can choose whatever model you like for your V, whatever you think is the best model for V. But if you make this choice, we can actually use Black Scholes Merton formulas and price and price uh, corporate that easily uh, using those formulas. So you see how Black Scholes Merton uh, approach is really powerful in the sense that okay, maybe it's not the most realistic model, but the idea uh, of uh, being able to price in this model and hedge risk and and uh, and have call options and put options uh, on stock on the value of the firm and having formulas for that it's really you know goes from pricing stocks to pricing bonds to pricing the derivatives to pricing corporate corporate bonds to pricing uh, to modeling value of the firm which is just just gives you a very powerful tool at least as a, in a in a tractable model maybe not completely realistic but tractable model to to try uh, compute at least the first benchmark values for whatever your problem is fine uh, going back to to the difficulty here that uh, v is not really observable uh, well there is uh, if you believe in the Black Scholes model, there is a there is a way to deal with that. Namely, what is not observable here is is v. I'm just doing this at time zero, but you could do this at other times. V is not observable, and and therefore also the volatility of v is not observable. So those are two unknowns. However, we also have two equations for these two unknowns. We know in the Black Scholes Merton model that the stock being the equity being the call option on the value of the firm is given by the Black Scholes formula, where for the underlying you use V and for the volatility you use sigma V. Okay? That's one equation in the Black Scholes model uh, which connects the stock to the value of the firm. On the other hand, we also know delta, how to hedge how to replicate in the Black Scholes uh, Merton model. Namely, if you want by Ito's rule, we know that the E uh, is uh, something dt plus um, the first derivative, let's call it delta, uh, uh, maybe delta E uh, times uh, sigma V dW, sigma V V dW. Okay? That would be uh, that would be just from Ito's rule, the first derivative and then times whatever was uh, the dw term, which is sigma v times v from the previous slide. Right? On one hand, on the other hand, uh, dE is just going to be something dt plus sigma e, the volatility of the equity of the stock, times e dw. Right, this is just the Black Scholes model saying that. Uh, well, not necessarily Black Scholes because sigma may not be constant, but Black Scholes type model where, where uh, instead of S, I will write E. Right? So, so then I make this equal to this, and that will give me the second equation. Okay? It's basically the delta of the of equity. So if I do that, uh, it's written up here. I have uh, sigma E E is equal to delta of the call option, but I know the formula for the delta of the call option is n of d1. So it's going to be n of d1, which depends on uh, the underlying value v0 and sigma v, times uh, v of 0 sigma v, which is coming from here. So it's delta sigma v, uh, and that's here. n of d1 is delta sigma v. Right? So this gives me two equations with two unknowns. Uh, they are nonlinear equations, but I can easily solve them numerically. And uh, in principle, you solve your problem, your difficulty that V and sigma V are not observable because uh, equity is observable, the, va the s value of the stock of the company is observable. And if you can observe the value of the stock, then you can also estimate the, uh, the volatility of the stock at each time. Okay, so. Assuming that can be done, you're observing the stock, 
prices uh, of the company and you're also observing the volatility of the stocks of the company, then you can solve this two by two system and you can find your V and sigma V. Okay, that might not quite work in implementation, might be much harder, uh, but uh, you know, if you, if you, this is the basic idea, if you make this work on this, make it more sophisticated, be careful how to implement it in, uh, with the real data, then, um, then you have a company like KMV, which uh, based uh, uh, part of its business on, on these ideas. All right, so that's uh, uh, structural models, and I'm not going to say much more about that.